Professor McNeil. Thank you very much for coming this Thanks morning. Thanks for having me. Good yeah. morning. Good morning. All right. Well, let's uh, speak about the issue of, of cultural diversity. Um, I know that uh, you have been in, uh, uh, in, in Trinidad and Tobago for uh, a while now. What has been the message? Hmm. Well, I started coming to Trinidad 25 years ago. I like how you say Trinidad. Yeah. <laughs> 25 years ago, that yeah. was 1997, before mm -hmm. people had, you know, computers and internet in their homes even. I, but the backstory is that I lived in India when I was 21 years old um, for a year doing Hindu and Buddhist studies. I lived in a Burmese Buddhist monastery in the state of Bihar, northeast India. Um, and I traveled around and that kind of turned me on to South Asian religious studies. But then one thing led to another and I ended up here um, as an early graduate student. And in 1997, I came for the summer and I was going to spend half the summer here and then I was going to go to Guyana because I was thinking about where to do my doctoral research. I never reached Guyana. I just <laughs> came here, never made it to Guyana, and here I am 25 years later. I've lived here about 13 or 14 years total and doing lots of research um, on Indian heritage, culture, history. Um, I, my first book is a comparative study of Orisha worship and Shakti Puja, which was a big project. Um, but my focus since then has really been on the Indo-Trini side of things, yeah. uh, reconstructing the history, uh, cultural practices. Um, and so one of my big projects now is I've reconstructed the history of Indo-Trini mortuary ritual, yes. funerary practice, and the revitalization of pyreside cremation. Um, I've published about that, um, but I've decided to start making film because obviously, you know, not so many people read <laughs> academic stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's a really fascinating story. Um, this, I mean, it, some people think, oh, you're studying death. It's kind of an arcane, maybe morbid topic, but it's really, it's extremely fascinating story in and of itself. Um, so I've reconstructed that story. I'm telling the story in film now. I'm working with a Trini Nigerian filmmaker, uh, Tayo Ojoade. Um, and it's a really interesting experience for me, being a researcher and being a scholar, but now entering the space of film and cinematic narrative and thinking about how to turn history into an accessible, you know, an accessible... Yeah. Uh, and the film, um, how soon uh, mm. can we, can members of the public mm. view it? Is it anywhere near completion? We're working really hard. We've been working for about a year and a half. <clears throat> um, I have a full-time job, you know, teaching, yeah. supervising 10 graduate students, uh, associate editor for an international journal. So I'm really busy, but we're, we're working really hard. And we're hoping to have a draft within the next maybe two to three months, a working draft. We want it to debut in the TT Film Festival next year. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, let's hopefully speak about soon. The, yeah. Well, it will be soon, not hopefully. It yeah. will be soon. <laughs> <laughs> a few months, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. soon, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the importance mm. of the film, the importance mm. um, of the message, the importance mm. of the history to the wider population. Mm. Well, one of the interesting things that I found when I started looking into it, my first book was published in 2011, and I really sort of started pursuing this research at that time. Yes. It was a side project, interestingly. Someone asked me to speak about it, um, since I had kind of established myself as an expert in Caribbean Hindu studies. So I said, but I actually don't know that much about the you know, death and funerary practice. So I said, but that's very interesting. As an anthropologist, it's you know, a fascinating long time topic. So I started looking into it and I ju it just sucked me in. Um, and what's interesting is that many people, because pyreside cremation is like the standard thing for Hindus here, yeah. um, everyone, or let's say most people tend to assume that's just how it's always been, right? And it is, a, you know, theologically, it's a very important uh, method of, you know, corpse disposal, you know, dealing with the dead body. Yeah. Um, in India, in Hinduism, in the Hindu tradition. But what it, what's interesting is that it turns out that really um, there's no evidence, there's almost no evidence in the historical record for cremations here during the indentureship period into the 20th century and even up to like the 60s, 70s, 80s. It picked up over time, um, but in fact most 
Hindus and well, Indians buried, but especially Hindus. And um, it was a, uh, it wasn't illegal, but for all intents and purposes, it wasn't allowed. Um, so the effort to gain, you know, Hindu marriage rights, um, education, a whole set of things. Part of that was also the right to cremate. So it was also it was also a part of the struggle. It was a part of the struggle in the twenties, the thirties, the forties. And it took about 15 years of discussion and debate and activism and advocacy on the part of um, Indian, you know, activists and Hindu advocates. And um, it, uh, cremation, pyrocide cremation was finally legalized in 1953. Right. Um, there was one, cre I want to be clear, I'm not saying that there were no cremations. Mm -hmm. It's possible, but we only have one reference in any kind of historical records so of it wasn't cremation. practiced widely so but it's a very spectacular thing yes. it takes you know so it would have caught the attention of the authorities yeah. um the in 1940 one of the kripalani brothers the kripalani yes. round about in barataria one of the kripalani brothers died he was relatively young meta ram kripalani and he they he was indian you know from india and he petitioned the um, the colonial governor, Sir Hubert Young, at the time, for the right to cremate, saying, "This is how. This is what I need to do," and it was a really interesting moment. This is 1940. Um, the government said, "Well, the colonial government said, okay, we'll give you the right to do it." So, in that sense, it's a win. But they said, "We're going to give you the labas. It has to happen in the labas." So, on what? You know, it was sort of like a win, but also a slap in the face. Of course. That happened in 1940. It was part of this, that was sort of fed into the, the struggle. And then um, cremation was legalized in 1953. And so the first uh, legal cremation started happening in El Socorro South on the Kareni River. I've actually documented the site now with my, you know, with my filmmaker's drone footage. It's fascinating. I'm actually looking for funds for the film. I want to make a plug for that. Um, <laughs> looking for funds to help because, you know, it's, you know, costs money and I don't have a big budget, namely my salary, yeah. right? And then also there's this, uh, the first cremation site on the Kareni River at El Socorro South where cremation started happening in 1953. I um, interviewed on site um, a living witness to uh, a cremation that happened in 1954. He was a teenager, so I interviewed him right at that site. But that's a like a small archaeological excavation waiting to happen. I'm also looking for funds to get a proper archaeologist in and um, do that excavation. But from that point on, it, that was a sort of portal that opened and there was a slow but steady growing, you know, stream of cremations that were happening. It moved from El Socorro South, it moved down next to, in the 70s, next to the highway, the South Highway on the Western side. And then after that moved to its current location. Um, and then the other cremation sites, Mosquito Creek, um, Shanti Thiram, um, that was, there were um, cremations happening there from the late, from the mid to late 50s and kind of growing there. It was down below and then it got moved up the hill. And then, of course, the Waterloo sites and then these other yeah. sites grew. So the point is, is that it was a hard one. The right, the, the cultural and religious rights to that um, had to be fought for. And what I like to tell people is that that particular colonial legislative council, the eighth legislative session of the legislative council, that's the same sitting that also um, uh, struck down the Shouters Spiritual Baptist Prohibition Ordinance. So it was a really interesting moment about a, you know, a decade before independence that um, a lot of ferment, a lot of change, and people on, on, on every side, you know, on the African and on the Indian and Hindu side, advocating for their cultural and well, religious Professor, rights. let me tell you something. You have opened up a lot of our eyes here this morning because some of the information that you have given us, I, I don't know that many of mm. us uh, would have known um, uh, when, it, when it came to cremations because we always, um, at least my generation, mm -hmm. it was it's what all, you know. It, it's what I know. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it, it does show, and, and from what you're telling us this morning, it shows the progression mm. uh, from where we have come and where we are um, right now. Um, let's, uh, let's speak a little bit about, because when we speak about cultural studies, cultural mm. diversity, I think that uh, it may be a new, 
a new term to, mm. to many of us. Mm. What does this entail? Mm. Good question. Well, I'm an anthropologist. Yes. Anthropology is the ology of anthropos, which means the study of humans. Okay. Um, archaeology is one of the subfields of anthropology. I'm not an archaeologist. Archaeologists dig up stuff, mm -hmm. you know, in the dirt or whatever. I'm glad they exist. <laughs> I'm glad they do that work. That's what I want to get funding to have a proper archaeologist do that work. Unfortunately, the archaeology center at UWE is no longer. It's sort of. Um, latent, let's say. It's not happening right now. The big archaeologist who used to be here is, is no longer here. Um, and then also linguistics, biological anthropology, and cultural anthropology. Yes. So I'm a cultural anthropologist. I study, you know, living societies. I talk to people. I hang out in rituals. I hang out behind the scenes, you know, like documenting right. culture, social relations, cultural practices, ritual practices, that, that kind of thing. So cultural studies is, in a sense, like anthropology, but it is um, it, cultural studies is, is, a, is a term for people who are interested in human experience, history, cultural ideas, practices, ideologies, traditions, who come at it from different disciplines. So you could be a historian, you could be a sociologist, you could be an art, you know, an artist or an art historian, but anyone who's looking at rigorously and systematically looking at you know, human cultural life is, in a sense, doing cultural studies. Mm -hmm. Cultural studies here at UE St. Augustine is um, a small but powerful faculty of three. Um, my esteemed colleagues, I love working with them, but the cultural studies program is um, housed within a composite department. It's the Department of Literary, Cultural, and Communication Studies. So yeah. we're with the English literature faculty. There's an MFA in creative writing. There's also communication <coughs> studies, and then there's cultural studies. Professor, we just have about one minute. Anything else you'd like to tell us this morning uh, before you leave us? Well, I mean, Trinidad is such a fascinating place. Um, it's a cultural, it's a, you know, a hothouse. It's a, like a, a sauna of cultural diversity and mixture. And it's truly an, a a, an, of cultural it's a, diversity. an astounding place yeah. because there's so much mixture and crossover and cross-fertilization. And you have people doing, you know, yes. um, Afro... Trinbagonians practicing Hinduism. You know, there's so much going on. And yes. yet at the same time, their traditions and practices also keep their identities. And there's, you know, there's all this separate stuff going on, but it coexists. And then there's all this cross-fertilization. It's yeah. an endlessly, it's an endless, endlessly fascinating place for yeah. an anthropologist. All right, Professor, thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you for the education. Thanks for and, having um, me. Uh, I, I think that we can say thus far, congratulations on, on your Thanks. film that we expect to see uh, pretty soon. Yeah, we do intend to debut at the TT Film Festival in 2024 next, I think, September or October. So right. see you there. Yes. All right, Professor. Yes. Thank you very much thank again. You.